Hey, you know, with prayer and fasting, we're in this uh, season of prayer and fasting, so we're 14 days of prayer and fasting called Fresh Air. And uh, one of the things that we've found is you see miracles in this time. And, and we were praying for a little guy named Elijah, four-year-old. Uh, he's uh, a nephew of a fellow in our church, and he's been in hospital. He's been having epilepsy uh, seizures. He ended up in hospital this week on uh, Wednesday morning, we prayed for him, and uh, at that particular morning, he had a, ma- a big seizure, and this is what it says. His oxygen stats were, uh, after one hour, uh, oxygen stats after a one-hour seizure on Wednesday last week were 30%. At one point, the doctor said there's nothing more we could do. He was knocking on death's door Wednesday and Thursday this week, and, through, and this came through this morning. So this is what happened when we were in church this morning. And this is from his mum. He's off all oxygen, holding his own, 96% saturation. The doctors are scratching their heads. Not what they were expecting. Glory to God. How good's that? God's a God of miracles. If you're believing for a miracle, we're believing with you. And this season's a great opportunity to believe God for a miracle in your life or those ones around you. I love hearing the story of miracles. Now in Mark chapter 10, verse 46... There's this story of Jesus and he's wandering into a place called Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great crowd was around him. And and blind Bartimaeus, a beggar, the son of Kimias, was sitting on the roadside. Now, picture this because you've got to catch the pictures of these stories. Blind Bartimaeus was a guy. He was a beggar. He was there with his beggar cloak on. And he's sitting by the road. Uh, And here he is sitting. Long way down. And I imagine it would have been for him. And he's sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him. So the crowd around him were rebuking him, telling him, shut up. And and he had to actually couldn't see Jesus because he's blind. He's on the road. He's filthy dirty because he's sitting on the side of the road. And he cries out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now you picture this guy, blind, filthy dirty. He's rejected by the world because if you're blind, usually there's You've been cursed or you've sinned and you'll see that the disciples asked Jesus in another blind man's story, who sinned, him or his parents? And and this guy was rejected. The loud voices could have stopped him from him reaching his his destiny. You know, there's loud voices that'll disagree with what you're doing. They'll disagree with you being a Christian. They'll disagree with your faith. And they'll try and stop you from the destiny that God has for you. The culture of today cries out stop to Christianity. It cries out stop for it to having a voice. You see, all the crowd were looking on. There was a crowd. They were there to see the celebrity Jesus. And he was a celebrity. He was a big name in Jerusalem. He was a big name through the region. And they're all looking for Jesus. They're all wanting to catch a glimpse of what's going on. But there was one guy, a blind guy, that actually shouted out and got the meeting with Jesus. None of the rest of them did. He was willing to go above the crowd, go above the the normal, going above the small-mindedness of the crowd around him to actually get the encounter. My question is, are the voices stopping you? from getting your encounter? Is your small-mindedness stopping you? Small-mindedness is a curse. It's a thing I think we all battle with. Looking at other people that are successful and you go, oh, why are they successful and I'm not? Looking at people that are around you with a different opinion, instead of finding out and encouraging, going on a journey, we can shut them down. Our small-mindedness can stop us. The crowd can stop us. Small-mindedness is such a curse. How do you know if you've got small-mindedness? One of the things I find is that if I've got small-mindedness, I see problems, not solutions. So all of a sudden, I start to see all the problems rather than the solutions. You look around and you see problems. Oh, there's a problem here. They should be doing that. Now, you see it in the church. We hear it. Oh, the church should. 
and they do nothing. Hey, if that's you, get out of this small-mindedness. If all you see is problems, all you see is problems in people's life, all you see is problems in the church or your workplace or your family, get out of that. It's a sign of small-mindedness. God wants to push you through into something bigger than that. The crowd around you can stop you. What's your crowd like? The Bible says your friends will determine who you are. What's your crowd like? Who are you hanging around with? Do you hang around with people that pull people down or do you hang around with people that lift people up? You see, this crowd could have stopped blind Bartimaeus, could have stopped the blind man from receiving his miracle. I love the fact that he, when they did that, he cried out more. All the more he cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. Isn't it amazing how the crowd will change? All of a sudden, oh, hold on. He's, you're being called. Ha, huh, quick. And the attitude changes. Incredible, I find. And this is what it said. And throwing off his cloak. When you read scripture, there's these keys in it. And one of these keys here is when he threw off his cloak. Why is that so significant? Why is it in scripture? You see, the cloak was, represents his license to beg. That's what the cloak represented. So he was poor. The only way he raised any finances for his survival was to beg. And the cloak was his source of supply. So he threw it off. Now, you imagine for a minute the beggar sitting on the side of the road throwing a cloak off in a crowd. What are the chances he'd get it back? There's a crowd of people. He's blind, so he doesn't know where it went. There's people trampling on it now. And he threw it off. That step of faith, that, that threw it off, that when you're blind and you throw something away, you're not going to get it back. So all of a sudden, he's had that step of faith to actually sow his past for his future. He sprang up. I love the way the scriptures do it. It wasn't, oh, yeah, I'm blind and I'll, like the old, old me getting up off the ground. He sprang up. Sprang up and said to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, what do you want from me to do for you? It's an interesting question, isn't it? What do you want me to do? Now he's blind. Now, for us reading the story now, we know that he was blind and actually he wanted to see. But this guy's lying on the ground all he's been asking more for for everybody else was money. So all he's been asking for is money. Hey, can I have a, you know, some coins? And they give him coins. And that's where if you read the scripture that talks about alms, and you, you talk about alms, it's giving to the poor. It's the giving to the poor. It's known as alms. And that's what he would go after. So the blind guy would sit at the gates of either the temple or sit in the areas of the, the higher society people and would beg for arms and he would get some money. And maybe he was there going and Jesus is giving this opportunity, what do you want? And I think Jesus gives us the opportunity of what do we want? You see, when Maura and I were called to ministry and, and when we actually made the decision to go into ministry, we had a prophetic word and the prophetic word went like this, I'm calling you into ministry. But you can stay in business. And if you stay in business, I'll bless you either way. See, we, we have a choice. What do you want? What are you asking God for? Do you know what you want from God? Some of the things I find today is people have no idea what they want. What do you want? Oh, well, uh, Ferrari. The Ducati, Doug got one of them. What do you want? Because sometimes I don't think we know what we want. Sometimes I think we go in prayer and it becomes this ritual of, oh, Father, forgive me. Don't know what for. Give me. Don't know what for. 
But I actually think God wants us to know what we're looking for. That he wants us to actually pray with purpose, knowing what I want. I think some of our prayers in life are just to make us more comfortable. And we pray for comfortable things. Make our life comfortable. I wonder how many prayers we've prayed that if God answers our prayers, the world would change. Those prayers. The world-changing prayers. See, the blind man said to the rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. You see, when he threw that cloak away, that was his action of faith. His action. There was action to this miracle that he actually got the miracle that he could see. See, faith makes a way. Unbelief can stop a move of God. Sometimes we get caught because of the crowd. I can imagine blind Bartimaeus being, could he got caught in the crowd of saying, shut up and sit down and he'd miss out. The crowd telling him, be quiet. The friends around him saying, no, just leave the guy alone. He's a celebrity. But he pushed through and got a, and got something because of his faith. Mark chapter 6, verse 1 to 6 says this, and he went out from there and came to his own country. His disciples followed him, and when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished. So obviously they recognised it was Jesus. They recognised that there was amazing things happen, and they were astonished at what God was doing through Jesus, saying, where did this man get these things, and what wisdom is it that was given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? So they'd heard the testimonies, they've heard it, but they looked at it and said, well, that's just Jesus. He's Joseph's son. He's a carpenter for crying out loud. How could he do anything special? The son of Mary, James, Joseph, Judas, Simon. Are they not his sisters here with us? And they're all offended at him. Sometimes we can be offended when God uses the ordinary. And we can miss what God has for us. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honour except in his own country, among his own relatives and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there other than he laid hands on a few sick people and healed. I think that's pretty special anyway. But they missed out on the mighty work. And he marvelled because of their unbelief. And he went about the villagers teaching. Isn't it incredible that we can become so unexpected because of familiarity that we could miss the amazing of God. As a church, we could become so used to and so familiar, we could miss the move of God. And I sense God wants us to be after God for the miraculous, be after God for the miracles, be after God for the supernatural not just have church. And I think we do a good job of church. I do. I think people come and say how wonderful we do. But I want grace upon grace. I want God to move. My heart is to see Toowoomba ch changed. It's my heart. It's not just enough to have church. We want that. We want relationship. I want to see businesses prosper. I, I love the fact that we have prospering businesses sitting in the front row. In financial review, was it? The financial review fast 100? How good's that? Fast 100, real estate agent. I love it. Business is prospering. How good is that? We want that. But we want to have a move of God. We want to see God change lives. See, prayer and fasting, we pray and we fast, not just for us. We pray and fast to see a change happen, a change happen, reformation happen. Well, you know we need reformation. You rape in the newspaper and you see kids breaking into houses boldly, going to, to court and saying, yeah, I did it, and getting let off and go out and do it again. We need reformation. We need a move of God in the nation. The prophetic word from years ago over Australia and particularly over Toowoomba, revival will start here. And we think, oh, that's wonderful, but that just means there's going to be a, a need for revival. I think there is. 
I think there's a move of God coming and I think it's coming this year and for us as a church I, I hear it and I see it I'm believing God for it but we don't want to get familiar with what we've got I love this last part of this scripture and immediately this is back to blind Bartimaeus and immediately he got up and followed Jesus so interesting because what Jesus said to him was this when I find it he said and the blind man said to him Rabbi let me recover my sight and Jesus said to him go your way so he gave him the option go your way so you can go your way or you can go God's way the thing about God is like he said to me I'll bless you in business or I'll bless you in ministry he'll bless you your way But there's something greater when we go God's way that God has for us. And this guy followed Jesus. He followed him on the way. He chose the kingdom over his own kingdom. He chose the kingdom over his own kingdom. Understand, this guy would have been a celebrity in the town now. Everyone knew he was blind Bartimaeus sitting on the side of the road. And all of a sudden, he can see. There would have been a lot of interest in this guy. The Jewish people would have been a lot of interest. How did that happen? Who is this Jesus guy? How did you get healed? All of a sudden, this guy would have been in demand. But he chose to follow Jesus. So my questions tonight is, do your prayers line up with the kingdom of God, the way the king operates in the kingdom laws? Or do you just pray for your own needs? You see, in Australia, we have laws that make Australia work, generally speaking, other than youth crime at the moment. And praise God, we might fix it, I hope. But generally, society works well because we've got a set of laws we live by. We, we have a set of parameters. We know how to do it. If you speed and you get caught speeding, you get a fine and lose some points. We know that. And some of us cho- still choose to speed. Not that I'd do that. Maybe. But... We left laws to live by, and the laws are there to keep us safe, but also to help us prosper as a nation. And it's the same in the kingdom of God. The same in the kingdom of God. If you pray and believe and obey, you'll see God move. And it's so important to catch it that we live within the laws of God. You know, we live in gravity and we stay stuck to the ground. I'm really happy about that. And there's laws to live by. And you think about the laws in the kingdom of God. And I want to touch a little bit about this tonight. But Luke 6, uh, 37 to 38 says this. Judge not and you'll be not judged. These are starting to give us some laws to live by. If you don't judge people, you won't be judged. He says, condemn not and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. I like those laws. It says this one, but I find this one really interesting. Give and it will be given to you. And all the other ones that we see that we go, hey, if you forgive, you're going to be forgiven. If you judge, if you don't judge, you, if, you ju- if you judge, you'll be judged. But we get to the area of giving and it goes, hold on a tick. For it will, if you give, it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, put in your lap. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. You see, there's something about the laws of God in generosity. And we talk about generosity in this church and we do because we want you to be blessed. We want you to catch it. But there's something about generosity that makes a difference in the kingdom of God. Generosity, particularly in our world, is a measure of faith. Because, you know, without faith, it's impossible to believe God. We see the blind Bartimaeus throwing off his, his beggar's cape. All of a sudden, he's making this step of faith. Our general step of faith is money. Because we go to work, we earn it. becomes a, our, our trans, How do we transact? We transact with money, don't we? The reality in Australia right now, if you want something, you transact. We don't generally barter. We generally don't go, okay, I've grown these carrots and I'll swap you the carrots for the zucchinis or the broccoli. You can tell I'm eating only vegetable at the moment. But we we transact with money. And it's an interesting thing that God in the scriptures talks a lot about this area of finance because it's an act of faith that we live in. 
And we put faith behind. So in our world and in the world that Jesus was living in, he talked a lot about money because it was the transaction of the day. So you step out in faith. And in our world, it's step out of faith in finance. Generosity is a measure of faith. The same action the blind man did was the same action we do when we give because we trust God more than we trust our money. So easy to trust in our money, isn't it? Really and honestly, it is. We can trust in it. We know that if we go to Woolworths, we can buy food. So we do. Funny story, you know, when Moira and I went to Bible college and we had just, I'd just finished this job that I loved. It was a job I loved. It was, um, I was Australian manager working for an offshore board. They just offered me international marketing manager and all these promises they gave me. And then they wanted me to go to America and, and work over there. I told that story late, the other day. So we had just bought our dream home. Um, it was perfect. Everything was perfect. And God called us to ministry. So we packed up and went to Bible college. We put our house on the market, left it furnished, because that's what you do. You have a furnished home to sell. And we went to Bible college on air beds and a picnic table. So much fun, isn't it? And we're believing God for the sale of the house, and we eventually got the sale of the house. But it was in April, and we were up there in February. And we had to believe God because we had no money. We went to um, this course, which was a, a, a Bible college course over, over a couple of years. And, and we went to Centrelink to get our Oz study, because you could get Oz study for it if you were doing the whole course. And so we went to Centrelink and we said to Centrelink, look, we're doing this course and we're only doing a year because that's what we, we were called to do, a year. And we went there and said, we're doing a year. And they said, we can't give you any money because you're not doing the whole course. You're not doing it that way. And we said, they said, but if you just say you're doing the whole course, we'll be able to give you a study. And we couldn't get any other form because we learned too much money because I was in a really good job. And we learned too much money the year before. So they said, look, we can't give you anything in any other way. So we were there in Brisbane with no income. Still got a mortgage. Still got to pay for Bible college. And we're still going to live. And we had our kids in private school. All choices we made. But we were amazed every time we needed something, we'd wander down to Woolworths. And if we felt like a roast, I always found this amazing. Whatever we wanted, did we? We wandered down to Woolworths, and there it was, marked down. There's something about trusting God. Miracle. And he was using it. You see, the process is more important than we, be we believe. The process of that, the journey of faith to build us for faith, for finance, to build us to faith. When you think about Highfields, if we bought 100 acres at Highfields, which is an incredible blessing, you know, we bought, bought it for a, a bargain amount. But now we've got to believe God for 25 million to build it. And God will do it. He's done it here. We've, we've got, I've got no doubt he'll do it. But it's interesting, the journey of faith. If you give, it'll be given. You see, I see people asking to be blessed, but they're not generous. The simple law of the kingdom is give and it'll be given back to you. But you see, it's not for your fame, it's for Jesus' fame. Doug said it so well last week and he said it this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, for Jesus' fame. When we receive the blessing of God and the hand of God on our life, as we start to action and sow, it's not for our fame, it's for His fame. But we get to go on the journey of life with Him. John, 1 John 5, 13 to 14 said this, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life and you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. If we ask anything according to His will. And there's so much confusion around that, but what's His will? Well, he went to the cross. And on the cross, he died for our sin. He died that we would break, every curse would be broken. He died for our healing, our redemption. He died that we will be blessed. That 
that's his will that you're free watch God's will to break the curses to see healing to have salvation to be blessed but the Christian life is not just an outcome it's a process so many of us step out of the process because we didn't get the outcome we expected but you've got to stay in it for the long term to see the benefit to what God has for you you see you see the plans of God for your life over your life not in the moment I remember another story of my work career I remember I was the general manager of the major systems group in a company called Chubb we did all electronic security in major systems around universities, government installations, all the big jobs, million, multi-million dollar projects. And I remember I was the GM, I was only a young GM at the time, and I got a phone call from the managing director. Now, it's not something you, I don't know, you don't like the phone calls from the managing director. It feels like I was going to the principal's office. And I got a phone call from his secretary actually and said, oh Ken, um, the MD wants to see you, come across to the head office. Driving across the head office, I thought, what have I done? But he said to me, he said, Ken, what I want you to do when I got there, he said, I want you to go and build a, renovate a building. So I want you to renovate this five-story building and I want you to move everybody from around Sydney, I want you to move them to that building. So I had to move lock and safe, Chubb Lock and Safe, they've been there for years. There was people that started work in Chubb Lock and Safe and they were 13 years old. And they were, I had to move them, you know, they'd gone to that place for their whole life. They were nearly 65, they were about to retire. Had to move fire and all these different people. I had to move them into this building. And I'm sitting there going, God, what's the story with this? Here I was, the general manager of the major systems group, flying around the world, flying around Australia, meeting all these people and now you've stuck me in a building site. Dealing with tradies. You see, it wasn't until later in life that I realised that God wanted to equip me for my future. Where we build buildings and we do things in church. I had no idea at that time. You see, but I could have bailed on the process and missed the outcome. See, it's a process. You see, sometimes I like the way Doug put it last week and I want to reiterate it this week he said we'd be happy with the answer to our prayers rather than relationship with the answer of our prayers we'd be happy with an answer rather than a relationship with Jesus we'd much prefer to have the answer than the process yet our growth and our future is in the process it's powerful if you can catch it. When I look at the journey of people in this church and as they start businesses or they go into to study or they go into different areas of life, you see the answers in the growth and so many people pull out. I see people pull out of university courses. Oh, this subject doesn't quite do what I want it to do. Not realising that that subject's going to be an answer to their future. I'm being guilty of that. It's small-mindedness. I hated statistics. Hated it, passion. Wanted to pull out of my masters because of the subject of statistics. But the process took me through to I need that today. What's God doing in your life? In your process? If you're a young person here, what's He doing in the process of your life for your future? When you pray your prayers, and this is all about prayer of fresh air and the beginning of the year. Galatians says this, but the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit in our lives, this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. There's no law against these things. You think about your prayer and you think about how you're praying and what your needs are. Are they filled with love, with joy? 
or we just go after things? See, what I find when I read that scripture in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, it sounds like a lot like what every self-help book is trying to get you. Every self-help book tries to sell you these things called peace or happiness. And in that, and the laws of the kingdom of God, the boundaries is where we find freedom. As we pray, that's where we find freedom. The boundaries of the law of God, one of the laws of God summed up by this very simply, to love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So if you think about your prayers and you think about answering prayer and you think about pushing through in this season and you think about not just about you, it's about how you love God and how you love others. It's how you sow into someone else's life. And the beauty is this, and that is that promise in that Scripture before that said, pressed down, shaken together and flowing over. And most people, that's what their desire is. But they choose to bypass the Kingdom of God. See, if you're looking for freedom, if you're looking for success, if you're looking for greatness in your life, find Jesus. Not just about Jesus, find Him. You see, then when you ask those questions in prayer, all these things can be added to you. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this amazing group of people. Father, my prayer tonight is that we catch this. We catch that you want us to be successful, that you want us to be generous. You want us to change the world. But you want us to do it in your ability, not just our ability. That we won't bypass you. But we'll actually come to you and then see what you can do through us. That, Father, we embrace the process of the Christian life. We won't be small-minded, Father. We won't just see the problems. We'll see the opportunities. And Father, we'll cheer other people on as they find success and go forward in you. And Father, every person in this room will find something that's so important to them. It's called freedom. And it's found in you. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Just while every eye's closed and every head's bowed in this room, if you're looking for freedom, tonight's your opportunity to find Jesus. Maybe you've been coming to church for a long time. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you've never been in church and this is your first time. But the opportunity tonight is for you to ask Jesus into your life. And find that love, that joy, that peace, that long-suffering, that gentleness, that self-control. To find this thing called freedom. It's not about religion, friend. It's about knowing Jesus. So right across this room right now, when no one looking around, if that's you, and you've never ever asked Jesus into your life, or if it's you and you've walked away from God, but tonight you've decided to come back, tonight's your opportunity. Young and old, it's your opportunity. If that's you and you've never given your life or you're coming back to Christ tonight, I'd love you to raise your hand just so I can see it, just so I can pray for you. I see that hand, thank you, that's awesome. See that hand, thank you, thank you. So good. You'll find freedom, friend, like you've never found it before. You think the thing about Jesus, He makes you better at life. One of the things I know is people want to be better at life. Right across this room, last time I'm asking, I look across tonight. And raising a hand is just an outward expression of an inward decision. It's actually the act of faith. Look across this room one last time. That's you. I don't want to delay it. See that hand. Thank you. That's awesome. Fantastic. So good. People giving their life to Jesus. Let me pray for you. And then I'd love for you to pray a prayer, a simple prayer. Father, I pray for everyone that raised their hand tonight. Father, I pray that they find freedom. They find you. Out of this prayer tonight, we pray together 
Father, I pray that you enter their heart and change their life to make them better at life. Father, they'll find love. They'll find joy and peace and long-suffering. They'll find self-control. They'll have the ability, Father, to, to stand out just like blind Bartimaeus and have your attention to change their world and the world around them. If you raised your hand, why don't you pray a prayer like this? You can pray it right now or you can pray it later. But it's a simple prayer, but a powerful prayer. It says, Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord, to be my Saviour. Forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong. Jesus, I ask you to make yourself so real to me. In Jesus' name. Amen.